Okay, we're good. All right. Cross-sectional studies are also called prevalence surveys, okay? And remember the famous Santa Clara County Zero Prevalence Study, right? On two days, April 3rd and 4th of this year, they had a whole bunch of county residents tested for uh, COVID antibodies. And then they estimated that the prevalence of antibodies um, was in, uh, found in 1.5% of all the people uh, tested, okay? So this is a typical cross-sectional one-time snapshot of a population, right? If they had followed up the entire Santa Clara County residents over time and did multiple testing at multiple points, then they could truly look at negative people converting to positive and developing new infection. None of that is possible in this design. All they could get is at this particular point in April of this year, this many people had antibodies. Okay, All they can realistically get from this study is prevalence of antibodies, which is a surrogate for infection uh, in this community. Okay, so this is the uh, 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 typical cross-sectional prevalence study. Okay, and again, to go back to how we think about it, let's imagine if we could follow up all of Santa Clara County residents into time. Say it's from January to today, somebody was following up Santa Clara County residents and as and when they become antibody positive, we detect them as a case, right? Um, unfortunately, that requires a cohort design. Instead, all we can do is to take one single slice in time and on that particular day or week, if they tested everybody in Santa Clara County, how many will be antibody positive, right? And as you can see here, when you test in time, on the day you test, on the time you test, you could completely miss patients who had the infection in the past. Right? If somebody had recovered from COVID in January, you will miss them because the antibodies may have disappeared. Um, uh, antibodies may have disappeared at the time you are actually doing the study. Right? If somebody is going to develop COVID next month, you're going to miss it. So everything in a prevalence survey is dependent on when you are doing that cross-sectional slice in time. Right? Think of it as a movie, and you're only seeing one. Uh, single still picture from the movie, right? Whatever you see in the still shot, you think is what is happening in the movie, but clearly the movie is not complete because one snapshot that you get might not capture the, the complexities of the movie, right? If you want a movie, do a cohort study. If you just want a single still uh, image, then you do a cross-sectional study. So uh, cross-sectional surveys are also called prevalence surveys provides a snapshot, not a moving uh, image. Um, and you basically use it to just look at disease burden. You wanna know what proportion of people have some illness or what proportion of people are voting Democrats versus Republic or whatever. And that's the kind of simple, simplistic description of statistics you can generate. And it's fine. If that's what you wanna do, then the design is perfect. But if you wanna answer causal questions, on our is uh, you know uh, smoking associated with COVID. This is a pretty hopeless design for all the reasons you will see uh, in a second, right? So the outcome is essentially, and you recall this from previous uh, lectures, there are two types of prevalence estimates we can make: a point prevalence and a period prevalence. Point prevalence is exactly what Santa Clara County did on those two days. C is the number of people who had antibody positives. N was a 3,000 people who were tested at that time, and you basically get 1.5% as a prevalence of antibodies on those two days in April of this year. That's about all you can get. It's a classic, beautiful example of point prevalence, right? Period prevalence, and that's, a, that's what I said, the point prevalence is uh, the Santa Clara County is the best example I can come up with on a simple uh, point prevalence estimate of 1.5. Now, Period prevalence is a little bit more sophisticated because it takes into account that you could do a survey over a length of period of time, right? Let's say India were to do um, uh, the famous NFHS survey, right? Even if the NFHS survey is only cross-sectional in as much as each family is interviewed at only one point in time, it might still take time 
for NFHS to be complete, right? So then you say, okay, NFHS ran over an entire calendar year, right? So people may have disease during various time periods of the calendar year. So how do we account for that? So you basically say, you take all the prevalent cases at the beginning of the time period. And if any new case happens during the entire one year period, you take them in as well. All of them go into the numerator. And the denominator is the entire population who was available at any period during the one year period, right? So the period prevalence captures a longer period of time than a point prevalence, which is at one point in time, but it is still a prevalence, okay? So an example that I gave you, let's say you are doing a period prevalence survey between T1 and T2, two time points. Let's say it's a one year time period. You take all the cases that appear, right? Um, during the time period at the start, at the end and the middle. And then anyone who is available in this entire time period goes into the denominator and that gives you the um, period prevalence. So what's the relationship uh, conceptually between prevalence and incidence. Think of incidence as what is feeding disease into the community. New cases are happen, they get popped into the entire community, right? New cases add to the disease pool. So every new COVID case is adding to the pool of infected people in all of India, right? For example, and prevalence is new people with the infection as well as people in the past who may have had the infection. All of that is the prevalence category, right? Now, what takes away numbers from the prevalence? Every time a COVID patient dies, they're no longer in the prevalence pool, right? They've been exiting from the prevalence pool. If people have recovered fully, then again, they're no longer in the uh, prevalence pool. Right? So think of prevalence as the pool of people, new and old, while incidence is the new patients who are being added to the pool of prevalence. So if you took um, diabetes, for example, you could say 10% uh, of Indians have diabetes, right? New cases of diabetes are entering into the population every year at a certain rate. And anyone who's a diabetic is diabetic for life, so they don't exit the pool. The only way diabetics would exit the prevalence pool is if they die, either due to diabetes or due to some something else. But recovery is not a, a possibility with diabetes or HIV or heart disease uh, or schizophrenia. You stay in the prevalence pool for a long time, right? So prevalence generally works well when you're not talking about acute short duration illnesses, right? For acute short duration illnesses like diarrhea episodes, COVID episodes, measles episodes, incidence is a way better uh, uh, concept than prevalence, right? Also, nobody has measles for life, right? You could have measles antibodies for life, but clinically nobody will have measles for life. Nobody will have diarrhea for life. So prevalence is not a great concept when you look at acute short duration. So anything that is acute short duration, think incidence. Anything that's likely to be for lifelong or a long period of time, think prevalence. So what factors can increase the prevalence of any disorder in a given community? As we discussed, if you have disease for life, then prevalence will always go up, right? Long duration illness will always keep adding to the prevalence pool because people stay in the disease pool forever, right? Prolongation of life without cure. In the early days of diabetes, I'm talking about well before insulin was discovered, you get di diabetes, you often died because you simply didn't have therapy. But if you now have insulin and if insulin was accessible, you could live with the disease for a long period of time. Antiretroviral treatments before the 19, uh, in the early days of ARVs, a lot of HIV infected people died. Right? There was no easy way to, to save them. But now you get HIV, you can take ARVs and continue living a fairly long life. So the prevalence of HIV goes up because more people are now living um, uh, without a cure, right? Uh, obviously, increased incidence will increase the pool in migration of cases, right? Suddenly, a whole bunch of people with infection coming into the community, then it pushes up your prevalence. Out migration of healthy people. Sick people came in, healthy people moved out, your denominator is shifting.
that can increase uh, incidence. Better diagnosis and reporting is often underestimated, right? If you simply didn't have a good surveillance system, you might think the disease prevalence is low. Once you have a good mechanism for investigating diagnosis, suddenly your disease rate starts uh, looking much higher. It's not that it went up suddenly, it's because you're picking it up at a higher rate, right? And this is often important to know in this particular pandemic, I think testing for COVID is one of the biggest rate limiting steps. You don't test, you don't pick up COVID, you are underestimating your two disease burden, right? So uh, bottlenecks in testing and reporting are also critical to, to understand. And whatever I said, the opposite of all of those will decrease the, the prevalence pool in the population. So what is the advantage of a cross-sectional study? Well, you could get a representation of what is happening in the general population. It's fairly convenient could be inexpensive, could be fast, can look at several exposures and several outcomes. If you are interviewing people, you can ask them about a whole bunch of things. Like NFHS is a great example. Uh, it was supposed to be family and health, but then it uh, goes well beyond contraception. You can ask about uh, self-reported uh, diabetes, self-reported tuberculosis, all sorts of interesting information can be gleaned from a large uh, representative sample survey, right? Um, and it's it's great for common diseases with long duration, but it's not great for acute uh, short duration uh, diseases. And prevalence surveys are great because they can throw up interesting hypotheses that we can uh, look at in, in future studies. So the limitations are many actually. As you can see, this is a cohort that's ongoing in a community, but we are sampling at one point in time, right? That's what makes cross-sectional. We could have done it here, we could have done it here, but we choose to do it here. So what does that mean? Well, we are only picking up people at that point in time. We have missed all the people before, we'll certainly miss all the people who will develop the disease in future, right? So all we can say is at off, as of this point, this is a prevalence of diabetes. Doesn't mean it's gonna say the same next year or the year after, right? So um, we clearly, we also miss acute short duration events that will pop in, pop out, pop in, pop out, because anything that is short duration will get missed in a, in a cross-sectional study, right? The only way to get that is longitudinal uh, cohort studies. Also, anytime you find people in the community to interview, you take it that they're already survivors, right? because dead people are no longer available to be included in a prevalence study. If a study, if, a, if an illness kills a lot of people, and then you do an interview or a cross-sectional study, you've pretty much gotten the survivors in the community. And survivors may have a very skewed exposure profile than people who've already died, right? So basically you miss people in a, if an illness is highly likely to be fatal, and then you do a cross-sectional survey, you will not find the dead people in your study, right? So that's important to remember. So that's basically a summary of all the limitations of a cross-sectional study. Single point in time, cannot pick up incidents, can only pick up cases who are survivors, right? People who developed the disease and died are no longer available. Short duration illnesses will be missed generally, and we can never get temporality Right? We can never tell in a cross-sectional study which came first. The disease came first or the exposure came after because we are not following up exposed but non-diseased people to look at uh, incidents over time. Cohort study is the only one which can nail the directionality. Right? You can say, yes, this person did start smoking 10 years ago, then in the 11th year, they got lung cancer. The lung cancer could not have preceded smoking, right? The, the cause must uh, precede the effect, right? That's why it's, a, it's called a cause, right? So in this case, cross-sectional studies can never really um, delineate clearly that there is a temporal relationship between cause and effect. And then we spoke last, last time about all the biases in cross-sectional studies. The biggest bias in any cross-sectional study is uh, sampling. How did you do the survey sampling, 
right? And we we saw in the in the um, example of Santa Clara County, where your sampling frame itself might be skewed, depending on how you define the entry criteria into the study. If you required people to be on Facebook, then you've already taken a very narrow sampling frame. All the people not on social media got excluded. All the people who don't have smartphones may get excluded. All the people who are too busy to be on social media got excluded. All the poor, vulnerable, marginalized people may have gotten excluded. So by, by defining your sampling frame in a certain way, you can bias the study towards a certain outcome, right? Intentionally or not. So sampling is absolutely fundamental. So textbooks have been written about how to conduct survey sampling, right? This is not a trivial issue. If I were to do a sample survey, I would uh, speak to a specialist survey methodologist because they agonize over exactly what's the sampling frame and how do we get an unbiased sample. We just spoke about the challenges of doing telephone surveys, right? Who has a phone? Who's listed? Who's listed and available? Who picks up the phone? who agrees to consent to a telephonic interview. All this is like a massive funnel, right? You start off with 10,000 phone numbers, only 9,000 may still be alive, right? Everybody else has changed the numbers. Of the 9,000, maybe 8,000 are listed. Of the 8,000, 7,000 were contacted. Of the 7,000, 6,000 answered. Of the 6,000, 1,000 said yes. You basically have a massive attrition in your sample, right? Now you are agonizing whether the thousand who agreed are truly representative of the 10,000 phone numbers you started off with, right? That's the kind of uh, issues that we need to worry about. Non-response is a big problem. Who agrees to be in your study or not? Uh, Non-coverage bias, right? You completely missed. You go to a village, you do the survey, you've totally missed that there may be a small attached colony uh, away from the main village that has really poor people who are not uh, considered um, a part of the main community, but are still part of the village, right? All sorts of interesting things um, um, happen when you do survey sampling, right? Um, in terms of information bias, again, every, every cross-sectional study uses some tool or instrument, right? In this case, it was a Santa Clara County, it was a antibody test then you have to ask yourself, okay, how good was the antibody test, right? What's the sensitivity specificity of the antibody test? And how does that come up with the overall prevalence of 1.5%? Was that 1.5% a real prevalence or could it all be false positives? To understand this, we really need to understand the sensitivity specificity of every single instrument or tool that we use. Right. Let's say I was doing a prevalence survey on depression in a community in India. Right. Again, what instrument am I using to measure depression? Right. How good is that instrument? Who is conducting the interview? How long are they spending on, on, on this depression assessment interview? Um, is there a blood test that I'm doing? What else can I do to uh, bolster my information collection, right? So again, uh, the the mental health questionnaires, for example, also have a sense, certain sensitivity and specificity, right? Uh, every question has a sensitivity and specificity, right? If I said, um, uh, are you a smoker? Well, that question has its own sensitivity and specificity, right? Um, so at the end of it, you really need to know how good your instrument or tool was and what is the amount of misclassification you're gonna find in a uh, sample survey. So next class, I will use the zero prevalence as an example to walk you through how we compute sensitivity specificity and something called predictive value of a test, right? If you found a Santa Clara County resident to be antibody positive, what is the likelihood that they truly have COVID? Well, that depends on the uh, accuracy of the test. Sometimes the test could be completely falsely positive, right? So, um, and it might mean nothing. Sometimes we get, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've had issues where my Apple Watch tells me I have a high heart rate, right? So I got alarmed, then I went in for a cardiac exam and the cardiac test showed, showed nothing, right? So the Apple Watch has its own sensitivity and specificity for picking up 
uh, heart rate disorders. It's supposed to even have an ECG on it, right? But if I use the ECG on my Apple Watch, is that the same as doing an ECG in a hospital done by a trained technician? The answer is no. It has its own error built into it. And we need to worry about all this, especially when you're doing it on a large number of people, right? When you go into the community, then you do a test. And if the test has small errors, it'll get amplified when you do it on thousands and thousands of people. So that's basically uh, the quick uh, survey on um, cross-sectional designs.